of listening to Dickin, uh, my uh, my dear friend and um, and uh, colleague, um, and uh, Danish. This organization, Three P D K, is a nonprofit organization, and our vision is to bring the work of Sydney Banks into the world. Um, and we do so mainly in Danish, but today Dickon is going to do his very best to speak Danish, and he knows several words. <laughs> he knows the word hygge very well. <laughs> uh, that one I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but um, no, but the, the, the organization is, uh, is committed to um, bringing uh, the three principles into the world, uh, mainly in Danish, but we also have uh, lately been uh, inviting people like yourself who study directly with, with Sydney Banks, um, because we really want to have a foundation for people who have not met, uh, who have not learned from Sydney Banks directly and who may not know who he is. And so many of the people who are here today also um, have not met him and also don't know so much about him. So we've had you, we, we have you now, we have had um, Christine Heath, we've had Judy Sessman, we've had Bill Pettit to, to tell us some stories about the, the meeting that they had with, with Sid and what it meant to them. And I know you, Dick, in today's, all, uh, you'll also speak about why is this relevant to us? Why are we looking in this direction? So the relevance of, of his work, uh, how it affected you and how you think it will affect the world. So welcome and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. No, you're welcome. I, I've been looking forward to this uh, for a long time. So it's great to have everybody here. <clears throat> you throw a really good party, Natasha. This is great to have everybody here at this come as you are party. So shall I jump right in, Natasha? Well, I didn't start as a psychologist and I didn't start with an understanding of the principles. I graduated from college and I had an English major in college and I had done student teaching and I fell in love with teaching. So I started my career as a English teacher in a high school. And I was 22 years old, newly married a month before I started teaching still married 53 years later to the same wonderful woman. So you can see this goes back a little ways. When I started and I looked younger than all the high school kids I was teaching. As a matter of fact, on parents' night, the, when I stood up in front of each class of my students' parents for an orientation, they thought I was a student playing a joke. But because I, I looked so young, I couldn't believe so many kids started coming to me to talk about their problems. And pretty soon the head of the guidance counselors came to me and said, what are you doing? He said, you're talking to more students than we are. And I said, I, they just come to me with their problems. And, and I had studied communication skills. So I, what I did was I taught communication skills to these students. And sometimes it really helped. And it was very rewarding to think I could share something with somebody that could make their life easier. And that started my passion for finding out what I could learn that I could share with other people that would make their life easier. So I went and got my master's degree in counseling psychology because there were people in the field of education that were very interested in 
the well-being of students and how to draw out the well-being of students. And then I went and I got my doctorate in counseling psychology. And I found more and more people that were interested in well-being. So I was trained as a psychologist in an education program that trained psychologists. And in education, they didn't think that if people had difficulty, they had a mental illness. They said, if anybody is having difficulty, they just haven't learned what they need to learn to have an easier time of life. And I love that philosophy because of all the students in high school, there were many students that got, that got labeled as troublemakers. And when I looked at these students, I didn't see troublemakers. I just saw a bunch of kids. I didn't see mental illness. I saw kids that were struggling to do well, sometimes in very difficult situations or to do well, they were struggling to do well with their parents and they were struggling to do well with their friends and their boyfriends and girlfriends. And so I became a psychologist. And when I became a psychologist, there were a number of different schools in cognitive psychology, which studied the thinking that we were doing. There were a number of schools that had to do with feelings that studied people's feelings and tried to help people get in touch with their feelings and be able to be more comfortable with what they were feeling. The existential humanistic schools there were other schools that had to do with behavior, trying to help change people behavior so they could have a better time. I practiced as a psychologist for 10 years and during those 10 years, it went from being a handful of different approaches in psychology to 450 different approaches. 450 different approaches, every one with different theories and different ideas. There were no principles in the field of psychology that were universal, true for everybody, that were foundational. So the more I studied psychology, the more theories I had in my head about people, and it seemed like it was very complicated and difficult. And most of psychology pointed people toward what they were think had been thinking, what they had been feeling, what they had been doing before they came in for their session. So, all of psychology was pretty much focused on people's past, things that had already happened. What happened to you yesterday? How did you feel about that? What did you think about that? What did you do? What happened? Tell me your story. And it was all about the past and going into the past as a way of helping people get better. Now, all during these 10 years, I also was studying spiritual teachings primarily meditation. I love meditating. I would sit quietly, let go of everything I was thinking. And every once in a while, I would just find beautiful feelings of being alive and present. And so I, in my personal life, I would get caught up in a lot of thinking about life and people, which began to create more and more stress and difficulty in my life. 
And then I would go meditate to try and let it go and feel better. So I, in a sense, I was addicted to meditation as a way of trying to feel better. And I was reading, I was meditating four hours a day. I was reading three psychology books a week. Every one with different ideas, different theories, different techniques, different practices. I was waking up in the middle of the night right after my dream cycle so I could write down every dream so I could work on my dreams the next day. I had journals where I would write down what I was thinking and challenge and try to improve my thinking. I had affirmation notebooks, I had journals. And then I'm in a bookstore once again. I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books about psychology. Everyone with a different approach, different idea. Most psychologists that I talked to never once had a course in mental health. It was all about what was wrong with people. There's a diagnostic manual that psychologists and psychiatrists use if they need to give a diagnosis for someone. And when I started psychology, it was very thin. And after 10 years, it was huge. People were getting better and better at looking at how people behaved when they were caught up in their thinking and not feeling good and, and then would act out. And we got better and better at diagnosing and labeling people, but it didn't really, it didn't really address the fundamental problem. So I'm in a bookstore and I find a book that was the first book that tried to connect the teachings of Sidney Banks. I didn't know who Sidney Banks was. I'd never heard of him. Trying to connect the teachings of Sidney Banks with psychology. And I read it and something started to really stir in me. It made a lot of sense. And halfway through the book, I realized in psychology, you pick up thoughts about the past and think about it and analyze and think and go into memory a lot. And in meditation, you do the opposite. You let it all go. And it was like the two parts of my life I couldn't find a way to bring together. And here it's talking about a new understanding in psychology that had to do with waking up to the role of thought playing and you naturally begin to let that thinking go and fall into a natural meditative state. And I started getting very excited that these two worlds didn't have to be separate and apart and different. And I looked at the back of the book and there was a training center in Florida and I was way up in the Northeast and I called them up and said, who are you people and what do you do? Do you do trainings? So I went down to Florida for a five day program where I was first introduced to the fact that all human beings think, all human beings are aware and all human beings are connected to a mind that's actually a deeper intelligence than just our brain. I was introduced to the fundamental principles that are true for every human being. Now you have to understand psychology had no principles. They had hundreds of theories and different approaches. There was no unifying theory, no unifying principles that were true that could explain every bit of human psychology. 
And while I'm at this training, I'm having my first insights into the principle. <laughs> I'm sitting in a hotel, you know, at first I'm trying to understand it with my intellect and I'm trying to figure out what they're talking about. And, uh, but on, on the second or third night of the training, I'm in my hotel room and I'm sitting there and I'm just very relaxed. And then I start thinking about something that's going to happen a week later. And, I, and I'm thinking about it and thinking about it. And I start getting really anxious. See, I was good at that. I was good at worrying. I was good at thinking about life in a way that made me anxious. I lived with a lot of anxiety and worry. I could meditate and get rid of it, but as soon as I stopped meditating, I'd be back thinking about life in a way that made me anxious. I could use certain techniques to temporarily feel better, but as soon as I stopped doing the technique, I'd be thinking about life in a way that made me anxious. Other people think about life in a way that makes them angry. Other people think about life in a way that makes them feel hurt. Other people think about life in a way that keeps creating stress. So here I am sitting in my hotel room in my first training, asking 10,000 questions from my intellect. And I all of a sudden realize I'm thinking about something that's not even happening. And I'm just sitting here thinking up anxiety. And it's the first time I became aware of the fact that I was a thinker and that what I think about always creates a feeling and that that's where my feelings came from. I wasn't anxious because of this event coming up in a week. I was anxious because I was sitting here thinking anxious thoughts. And I went, oh my God. And I stopped thinking about that and the anxiety went away. So the very first insight I had was sometimes I can think about things that create feelings that create tension, stress, or upset. And either I'm, a, I'm aware I'm doing that or I'm not. And when I become aware of the fact that I'm thinking, it's like, whoa. Sid says, if you really become aware of the fact that you're tension, stress, or upset is created from thought, you'll automatically and naturally let go of the thinking that's causing you pain. It'll bring you back to the now. The now is where we are just naturally being ourselves without thinking about life. The present moment. Right? And I'm, I begin to catch myself worrying. And rather than worrying about things for an hour and then thinking that feeling had to do with my problems, I began to see, oh my gosh, I'm sitting here thinking about life in a way that's creating and keeping alive this feeling. And I started catching myself. And by the time I went back home, I had probably 60% less worry in my life, just from that one insight. So I got, I got very interested. My parenting changed. It got a lot easier. I started seeing what feeling I was bringing to my kids and started taking responsibility for what feelings I brought to my kids when I was parenting and started seeing it. Well, I'm the thinker. And if I wait a minute and come back to the now and that feeling of upset falls away and I feel better, if I parent from that feeling, I'll be a much better parent. And I stopped parenting from being bothered and upset by things my kids were doing and started parenting from a different state of mind. And I got very excited. I said, oh my gosh, I can be a great parent no matter how I was parented.
no matter what my past is, no matter what my personality is. I just have to be aware of the fact that I think and that when I fall out of my thinking, I feel better and I have more common sense. If I parent from good feeling and common sense, as opposed to my reactive conditioned memory, I'll be a good parent. I was so excited. I couldn't, it's like, oh, I got to learn more about this stuff. You know, I've just had a, a, a few insights and already I have less worry and less stress and I get over things quicker and, and I'm not blaming my wife anymore for when I feel upset. I don't think it's because of stuff she's doing or said. It's because of how I am thinking about it. My wife was thrilled. My kids were thrilled. <laughs> I'm more relaxed. I'm more present. They started saying, we've got our dad back. You always were thinking about life and now you're present and you're, you're lighter and you're more fun and you're not so serious and you just are like a little kid again. And in my first training, they mentioned that the people there had learned from a man named Sidney Banks. And I go, I got to meet this guy. I want to hear him talk. They said he discovered these or realized these principles in an enlightenment experience. And he's such an interesting guy. And I... He's a, he was a welder from Scotland. He was from Scotland. He became a welder. He had a ninth grade education because he, he was so poor, he had to leave school after ninth grade to work full time to support his family. He described himself as being an extremely insecure man. And then he had this experience and he stopped being an insecure person. And what he realized were what he believed to be the fundamental truth about human beings and how we work and what creates our experience. And his realization connected the two worlds of spirit and psychology. So that when people were having any experience, that that experience was not created by something outside of ourselves in the world. Situations don't create a feeling in people. You don't walk into a building and there's stress in the air and you catch it and feel stress when you're in that particular place. It's not outside of us. Our feelings are created from the energy of life. That's what he realized. All of life is being created from a formless energy. That's, that's very scientific. It's what all the physicists are saying, that quantum field is a formless energy. They're saying 96% of the universe is formless energy. 4% is matter. 4%. Now, in psychology, they had reduced a human being down to the 4%. You are your thoughts and feelings. So you got to work on those. You got to change those. You got to think about those. You got to change your thinking. You got to change your feeling. You got to change your behavior. And we got to talk about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors you've already had. You come in and tell me what happened yesterday you're upset about. And Sid said, thinking about the past in a way that brings up painful memories is creating suffering. He said, what's more helpful for people is to realize the fact that they think. Right now, 
right now, this creative energy of thought is creating all the mental activity in your head. And whatever thought is created in your head, you'll feel right now. You'll feel curiosity. You'll feel boredom. You'll feel sad. You'll feel if, if you're not listening to me and thinking about dinner, you'll have a different feeling. If you're thinking about your kids' problems while you're sitting here, you'll feel whatever you're thinking. If you think about something that had happened to you yesterday, you'll feel that thinking. When your head clears, you'll feel that thinking. It's not wrong or bad. The principles never tell people what they should feel. They just say, this is how it works. Energy creates your thinking. The power of thought creates your thinking. What a gift that thought can be created and we'll feel it. I get to, I get to go through life feeling happy and sad and hurt and angry and kindness and love. And I get to feel life. Without thought, I would be dead. I would have no experience. I'd be brain dead. I'd have nothing would be created. This is revolutionary to the field of psychology to say the source of all psychology is the formless creative energy of life. And without that, people innocently would say, if you're feeling bad, it's because of something in the world. Now, I've traveled around the world and asked tens of thousands of people, what are you feeling right now? No judgment. Well, you can imagine if you ask enough people, you're going to hear every feeling you can imagine. Now, that's normal to have feelings. There's nothing wrong with having any feeling. They're not good and bad. They're, you're just feeling your thinking. You can't not do that. But then I ask people, where do you think that feeling comes from? Unless people have learned the true source of their feelings, people will say, well, I'm feeling stress because of my job. I'm feeling upset because I'm having trouble with my kids. I'm feeling stress because I've been sitting in traffic. So sitting in traffic made me so frustrated. I'm feeling bad because the, the sun went away and I was hoping it'd be sunny today. I'm feeling happy because of what somebody did for me. I'm feeling happy because it's Friday. I'm feeling happy because, and people innocently would say that the source of what they were feeling was coming from the outside and Sid Banks realized what is becoming a totally new paradigm saying everything is created from the 96% of formless energy in the universe. They're universal principles. Physicists say matter on a subatomic level is there's nothing, a field of energy, and then that energy condenses into a subatomic particle. It becomes matter. And then at some point it goes back into the field of energy because it's all energy. It's all the same energy, whether in form or formless. That's what Sid Banks realized in his enlightenment experience. So he, when he had his enlightenment experience, he said to his wife right away, what I just realized, he had tears in his eyes. He just had experienced the unity of life, the connection to life. He experienced a love he didn't even know was possible. 
and he said to his wife, what I just realized will change the whole nature of psychology and psychiatry. And you and I will travel the world sharing what I've realized about the fundamental nature of life. So here's this man who was a welder, very insecure. He has one major revelation and suddenly he's speaking to auditorium full of doctors and people interested in well-being, sharing what he believes that has been revealed to him as the underlying fundamental principles of life that show the link between formless and form in human beings, and that our true nature can only be discovered when we go beyond our thinking, and then we begin to feel naturally more connected to life. So when I'm caught up in my thinking, I don't feel close to my wife, no matter what I'm thinking about. And when I wake up out of that thinking and fall into the present and I'm wide open, I start to feel closer to anything around me, the trees, the birds, my wife, my kids. So my true nature is love. But I had to find that out as you will, you have to find out that when you wake up out of thinking that you're caught up in and holding on to, which is the one thing that causes humans psychological suffering, you, we get innocently get caught up in our thinking, and then we start thinking that what we're thinking is true. We believe it to be true. I'm no good. I'm stupid. I'm not as good at so-and-so. I can't do this. Uh, um, uh, you're, you're, you're this certain kind of person. You're, those are all concepts and ideas. When we fall away from thinking that creates our tension, stress, or upset, there is no stress in the now. If right now you were to completely fall out of everything you're thinking, and you're not holding on to a single thought or paying attention to it. You're not thinking about life. You're just relaxed in the now and present. What's still here when you let go of all of your thoughts and feelings? What's always here? Natasha loves to talk about this. She, she's seen a lot about this is what's always here is just an aware presence. I'm not thinking about myself. So it's not this version of Dickon. It's just, I'm just present. There's the tree. Here's my hand. Here's my voice. There's all your beautiful faces. I can feel the chair I'm sitting on. I'm just an open, aware presence. I'm awareness, my true nature. Free of concept, what Sid called the state of no thought, pure thought, pure consciousness, awareness without being contaminated by ideas and beliefs and concepts. It's like being a baby, just wide open and aware, no concepts, no story. And the great discovery is when any human being touches this space of thoughtless, aware presence, there's a feeling in that that connects us to life in a nice way. That our true nature is free, is open, is aware, is wise, is loving. That's the benefit of having insight into the principles is over time, you spend less time caught up in thinking that burdens you and more time just being yourself in the present. Allowing every thought and feeling to flow through and you're just present.
and you begin to experience more peace. Your senses come alive, so you experience more enjoyment. You start enjoying nature. If you go for a walk in the woods and you're caught up in thought, you won't experience the beauty of nature. You won't even notice it. When we fall out of our thinking, then our senses come alive. They start singing. When I had COVID, I had COVID early on, I, over a year ago, I had COVID. And after two and a half weeks of being in debilitating pain, then my symptoms went away suddenly. And I went for a walk and I had no thinking on my mind. None. No thinking on my mind. My senses came alive. The wind on my cheek brought tears to my eyes. The, the bird singing was the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. The light reflecting off the ocean just stunned me in its beauty. For four days, I had no thinking, and I was living in what Sid Banks called pure thought, pure consciousness, pure mind. What Natasha and I, in our book called Coming Home, we, we get lost in our thinking, and then we realize we're lost, and we wake up, and we drop into the now, and we come back to our true self, the what's always here self this awake, aware, present self that's characterized by an inner quiet and a feeling. So Sid would say that learning the principles is a journey of love. It's, it starts in love and it ends in pure love, where you begin to experience a love that's unconditional, a love for the world, at the conference coming up in London, I'm going to talk about how it naturally wakes us into a presence that's characterized by a closeness and warmth toward whatever is around us, but it also allows us a recognition of how easily people can get caught up in their head and suffer. And so when we're in this loving state, when we fall from our head into our heart, when we're feeling that closeness to life and see somebody or something suffering in front of us, we naturally feel compassion. So Sid would say, look within, which means go beyond your thinking, just for a moment, just temporarily set aside your thinking. Drop into this ordinary space where you're just being relaxed and present, no effort, no tension in the now. No trying, no trying to feel better, no trying to think positive, no trying of any kind, just being yourself, just relaxed. And in that space, you'll discover peace of mind. No matter what mood you were in, you're a thought away from the now. Relax into it. You'll discover peace of mind. And then your senses come alive and you start to be able to enjoy life. And then you start feeling closer to people. So you start feeling this deeper, unconditional love. I don't have to get things right with my wife in my relationship. I have to keep coming home to a place where I love her unconditionally. And then anything can get worked out. Anything can get resolved. When we're in that space within, we experience love and compassion. And when we're in that space within, our senses are alive. When we're in that space within, we're not burdened by all the judgments and shoulds and have tos and confusion and upset. We're free of that thinking in the now. So we come home, we're comfortable, any feelings can flow through us. We're more like babies again. 
no story. If there's no story, there's no problem. And then this deeper wisdom helps us deal with anything that's going on. It, it's not passive. It's not avoiding. It's not denial. Wisdom is a proactive intelligence. It knows how to turn the flowers toward the sun. It knows how to help birds know when to fly away and when to stay and eat. That when I fall out of my thinking, without thinking about it, I just know what to do. When you drive a car, if you're caught in your thinking, you'll have an accident. I talked to a policeman who said every accident that happens happens because somebody gets distracted by their in their thinking. So we have to get fairly present to drive a car. And when we drive a car without thinking about it, you're making life and death decisions. You know why? Because wisdom decides. Wisdom lives us. Wisdom knows what to do. When, this is the great discovery. When I get out of my way, I don't become stupid, I become wise. I'm guided by the intelligence that knows how to create and operate the universes. That's why it's called wisdom. <laughs> it moves us toward well-being. It moves us toward thriving. It moves us toward what's best for the whole system, for everybody. It's selfless. It's not ego. I should do this. I shouldn't do this. I have to do this. I, we fall out of that thinking that creates tension. And then there's just a quiet, nice feeling that guides us in life. But you never want to take my word for it or Sid Bank's word for it. You listen to people pointing toward this space within that when you drop into you'll find out what the fuss is all about, why so many people are excited about learning about this space that's characterized by infinite creative potential, thought, wide open awareness with all kinds of levels of awareness and consciousness, and this wisdom intelligence that moves life toward thriving, toward love, toward compassion, toward cooperation, toward collaboration, toward building healthy relationships, toward building healthy communities, toward building a healthy world. Sid says, go within, you touch this space and something beautiful has to come in a feeling or a thought or an idea, we become nourished by our soul. And then we can go into the world and be of help. And by raising our level of consciousness, we help raise the whole level of consciousness because it's all one system. It's like an ecosystem. One part of the system gets healthier. The whole system is healthier. So we can each play our part in creating a better world by going within and letting that wisdom then guide us toward helping to act in the world in a way that's loving and compassionate and helpful. And we create better schools, we create better governments, we create better systems that's coming from wisdom. So we create a wisdom-based society rather than an ego-based society where it's me versus you and my idea is better than your idea and I'll argue about it and I'll fight you over it and I'm right and you're wrong and that's ego. That's this ego-based society. So the principles lead us to a space where we become more selflessly interested in what's best for the whole. So when I met Sid Banks, here's this man that I had heard about 
and I look into his eyes and he's, he's like a, have you looked into a baby's eyes? Oh my God. Just this openness, a depth and aliveness. And he was just an ordinary man. He said, don't listen to my words. I'm trying to point you within yourself. I want you to experience and get a glimpse of what I got an experience of. I want you to see that you can recognize the fact that you're thinking and drop out of everything you're thinking into this space that's free of thought, free consciousness, free mind, and you will experience beautiful feelings and it will help you, guide you toward living a beautiful life based in love and compassion. And it's for free. <laughs> There's no entrance requirements. This drop-in center is open 24 seven. It doesn't turn anybody away for any reason. All we need to do is let go of our personal thinking and we enter this drop-in center that's characterized by, it's where creativity comes from. My wife's an artist, that's where she goes if she wants to create a new painting. That's where poets go, that's where writers go, that's where Parents go if they want to find a different feeling and more common sense for parenting their kids. That's where politicians go if they want to work, listen better, and be more collaborative. Their fundamental, universal principles, all human beings think are aware and are connected to it. The intelligence behind life, our true mind is a deeper intelligence that includes our brain, but it's more than our brain. It includes the 4%, but it's the 96%. So we're, our true self is the 100%. And we're spiritual beings who have physical bodies walking around. And when we fall out of the physical, we go into this dimension of creative, wise, aware life energy. And the experience of that are beautiful feelings. What can I say? Now, all of you can meet Sid Banks. He died 10 years ago, you can still meet him. There's tons of videos and books and talks. And take his advice. If you watch one of those videos, if you think about it, I guarantee it'll get complicated and confusing. If you don't think about it, you'll realize he's not talking about himself. He's trying to point you towards something that's true for all of us. We all think. It's not personal. We're all aware that's not personal. If you take away the capacity to think you don't have a, you can't live, you don't have a person. Take away consciousness, you couldn't be aware of anything, you don't have a person. You take away a mind, there's nothing living us. Our hearts would stop, our minds would stop. We wouldn't be being lived by this energy. So now when I work with clients, I don't point them to toward theories and ideas and beliefs and techniques. I ask them to reflect on and consider something I think is always true. Always true. There's a force in life that is creating life. And because it's true, we can in quiet moments intuit that that is true and that is how it works.
So sometimes Sid would simplify it because with our intellects, we can make this teaching really complicated. And he would simplify it and say, okay, the only thing I'm saying is everything human beings experience is created from thought. It's all thought. There's no experience people can have that's not created from the formless creative power of thought. And when you, anybody realizes that it's helpful, we begin to take responsibility for our experience rather than blame it on the world. We stop feeling like we're helpless victims of the world. We start feeling more empowered because I'm the thinker. So it's all thought. And then he'd say, listen, listen. Just listen, not to anything in particular, just listen, wide open, just listen. It's another way of saying, step into the state of no thought, step into pure consciousness, step into an openness to this deeper intelligence, just listen. We're thought away from listening, thought away from our well being. just listen for a feeling, the feeling of being present. I can be in the worst mood. And if I'm in my thinking, I'm suffering and it's painful and it's tight. And when I wake up to the fact of thought, ah, uh, oh, it's like getting into bed and relaxing, letting it all go. It feels, ah, uh, the feeling of release, the feeling of surrender, the feeling of presence. And then in that feeling, there's all kinds of knowing. Without thinking about it, I parent really well when I'm in that feeling. I drive a car well. I used to do sports well. I didn't have to think about it. I just get present. Well, I hope this was helpful. I wanted to, I, I wanted to help you understand the significance for human beings to have principles that are true for everybody. And that how principles allow any of us to relax into life and just be ourselves and gain the benefit of this wise intelligence that wants to move us toward love and compassion and well being. Well, all we need to do is get out of the way. And then it keeps happening over and again. When I sit quietly, I don't become passive and do nothing. I suddenly stand up and go somewhere. Or I open my mouth or I keep it closed. That's wisdom living me. Ordinary. Just. Natasha and I joke, it's really great when we get out of the way and the other person shows up and takes over and does stuff we couldn't do. But it's ordinary, very ordinary. When Sid had his enlightenment experience, he fell into this natural, ordinary, always present state. And he realized it's available to everybody because it's our true nature. No exception. I've, I've worked with thousands of people who have all kinds of problems. And when they begin to realize thought and it brings them back to the now, the stressful, upset thinking falls away. They start to feel better. And then they know better exactly what to do in life. No exceptions, because we all work the same way.
principles are not ideas. They're not ideas. They're not beliefs. They're not concepts. The, you look up the definition of principle and one definition is that which is most fundamental. Well, what's most fundamental in the universe is the 96% of formless energy out of which the stars and planets and everything is created and human beings and animals. And that's what's most fundamental and essential. Without that, nothing would ever take form and have a life, be born. Mm -hmm. well, I hope this has been helpful for you. I can't thank you enough for inviting me to come and share what little I'm seeing about this, but I, it's made such a difference in my life and the life of my clients. My God, yesterday I talked to a 15-year-old girl who was suicidal, and I just talked a little while about how her experience was working. And I got an email later from her mother saying, oh my God, she was in such a good mood all evening and feeling hopeful again. It's not me not me she touched what's true and when people touch what's true only the truth will set people free not ideas not beliefs not concepts but what's true what's always true always will be true thank you so much dickin oh natasha you're welcome thanks for being here with and sharing with us we'll put this video on, on our YouTube channel so that more people will be able to see it. We have more than a thousand people uh, in, the, in the group who will um, hopefully see it and many more. Thank you oh, so much. That's awesome. And, and I heard Chris's banjo music playing in the background the whole time I was talking. So I just want to <laughs> let you know, thank you, Chris. It's good to see you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll see you. Ha, ha, ha.